as it's... It, it's time for the show. Um, oh, where is everybody? Um, <clears throat> uh, hi there. I'm Kermit the Frog, and we're, uh, well, we're, we're almost ready. Uh, <laughs> How you doing? Name's Robin. Nice to be, but you can call me Chuck. <laughs> I'd now like to introduce you to your pilot, a person who has been with this program since its inception. Captain, are you ready? W Radio, your information station. Welcome to the WDW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. This is show number 49 for the week of January 13th, 2008. I'm your host, Lou Mangello, and by the time you hear this episode, I will have run, and hopefully completed, my first, and possibly last, Walt Disney World Half Marathon. So, since I have to record and produce the show early in this week, there won't be any news or rumors, but I do have a few segments that I think you're going to enjoy. First, we take a detailed look at and review one of Walt Disney World's premier restaurants and prove that food in the parks is more than just burgers and fries, as Glenn Whalen and I take a trip to Canada in Epcot's World Showcase and visit La Cellier Steakhouse. Next, young Cody Pepper joins me once again for a fun game of Walt Disney World Fact or Fiction. Then, Steve Barrett and I will talk about some new hidden Mickeys, other hidden characters, hunting at the resorts, and then he's going to ask for your help in determining whether some questionable ones fit the bill. So lace up your sneakers, get ready... Get set and go enjoy this week's episode of the WDW Radio Show. We all know by now that Walt Disney World is unlike any place else on Earth, especially when it comes to a place that you can take your family to spend time together, whether it's for a week or even just a day. But I'm sure we've all had friends or co-workers who, for some reason, didn't come to us first say things like, yeah, Walt Disney World was great, but I I got tired of eating hamburgers and chicken fingers every day. So if you are like me and after you pick up your jaw off the floor and compose yourself, you explain to them that... Walt Disney World isn't just about hamburgers and hot dogs, but or even quick service meals, but really has some of the best dining options anywhere. And when I say anywhere, I don't mean in the Orlando area. I mean anywhere, as in, like, planet Earth. So today what I want to do is highlight one of those restaurants. And I specifically chose one that's inside of one of Walt Disney World's four theme parks to illustrate my point. And joining me on this culinary education program is Glenn Whalen, who is a contributor to the show as well as the DisneyWorldTrivia.com site, and he's also the owner of the Pass McCarty blog. Glenn, welcome, buddy. Lou, thank you for having me again. I appreciate it. We're, we're two for two for dining things, so we did Yak and Yeti <laughs> first, and coincidentally we're doing, uh, we're doing this next one. But like I said, what I want to do is highlight a restaurant that maybe the frequent visitor to Walt Disney World is, is you know, it's well known to, but to others, maybe the first-time guest is somewhat hidden because of its location and or sometimes how it's really almost unattainable to get a, a, a dining reservation door for dinner because of its newfound popularity. And I'm talking, right. of course, about Le Cellier Steakhouse in Canada in Epcot's World Showcase. Right, correct. Yes, it's. I mean, and the fact that it is uh, named after a cellar of the Hotel of, of Canada, you know, the, it can't be found unless you know it's there. Exactly. And, and we're going to cover that because what I want to do really is talk about not just the restaurant's menu, but its location, its decor, and even history. And let's start off a little bit about the history because it's interesting about the name first. Obviously, the name means the cellar, and that's exactly what it is. But it's not the name really is not Le Cellier. It's Le Cellier Steakhouse. And I make that distinction because a lot of people may not remember, Glenn, that up until 1997, it was simply known as Le Cellier but it was a very different restaurant in that it was really sort of a cafeteria buffet style. Right, and actually, Lou, last time I'd eaten there, it was still Le Cellier without the steakhouse there. So uh, last time I had eaten there, it was a, uh, a buffeteria. And in really sort of 
in stark contrast to its current popularity as one of Walt Disney World's probably toughest dinner tickets to get. Uh, at the time, it was regarded by a lot of people as almost the place that you went to when you couldn't get a reservation somewhere else. It was almost the, the last resort because it was not one of World Showcase's really premier restaurants. Yes, and, and that's exactly how I ended up there so many times because I couldn't get anywhere else. Uh, it was either Morocco or, or Canada were the places I was able to get or, uh, an ADR at that time. And now it's the opposite. I mean, you know. Now it's the opposite. <laughs> we can touch it. You know, if you don't make your reservations or, or man's dining reservations 180 days out, you may have, a, depending on the time of year, you may have a tough time getting a dinner reservation between the normal hours of, say, 530 and 7 o'clock, especially during the holidays and some of the busy weekends. Right. Right. And you, you do have to get that ADR. And, uh you know, jumping ahead, the quality of the food there, it is a place that I would recommend that you do definitely try to get that ADR. Yeah, walk-ups, you know, for the most part are a thing of the past because, like I said, the restaurant has had this newfound popularity probably over the last five to seven years. I mean, it really has exploded and the word has gotten out, uh, mostly, I think, due to the online community and podcasts and, and forums and things like that. People talking about and reading reviews about La Cellier, and I think they're warranted. But again, right, definitely. before we talk about the, the menu itself, let's talk about inside and the name Le Cellier and how it really connotes what you're going to see inside because it is designed to look like a wine cellar. And right. it, there's no windows, so you don't get any views. There's, you know, Don't bother asking for a window seat. You're not going to watch illuminations <laughs> from there. But right. the, the lighting is beautiful, and you really get this very intimate setting. And there's these beautiful right. stone archways and... The odd thing that I found about the restaurant is you think, okay, I'm in a cellar, I'm in a wine cellar, there's no windows, it's going to be cold, it's going to be, it's not like that at all. There's a fireplace in the center of the room and there's these beautiful sconces on the walls. Um, really, really a, a very warm restaurant, the opposite of what you might be thinking from the description. Right, and, and it's a lot of it's a lot of candlelight too, as well, and it brings out like the gold. Uh, it's a, the stone inside. It brings out a gold and pink flavor to it, so it feels like it might be dark, but it's really not as dark as you can expect a cellar to be. Not at all. When we talk about it being a cellar too and being overlooked by people, we should probably note that if this is not something as you walk by the pavilion that you might see. It's very easy to walk by because all you really see is the sign. Uh, over the archway that says La Cellier Steakhouse because it's kind of located down the hill past the, the, the gardens below the Chateau of Canada. So you really kind of have to look for it or, or know that it's there. It's very, or, yeah, it's like, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the, the, the Canada film, uh, O Canada, exits that way. So quite often it will look like you're going the wrong way as you head towards it because if, the, if, that, if that attraction is getting out, there's going to be 100 people walking towards you saying this is the exit. So that's actually happened to me a few times where I actually had to say, nope, I know where I'm going. I'm going to the <laughs> right. restaurant that's under there. So. Uh, the other thing we should note, too, about the inside is something that a lot of people might overlook is that the dining room is actually divided up into several different sections. And there's no real visual designation of it, but they're kind of meant to represent all the different provinces of Canada. And if you talk to your server, um, who are exceptional there, they'll be able to tell you a little bit about the story and a little bit about the different provinces. Right, and they're very proud of it, and, and they will ask you about it on the front end. And uh, they actually quizzed us on it, and I was very wrong. Uh, you know, I thought there were only five, and I thought one of them was maple syrup. So I didn't do <laughs> very well with that. So... Uh, but yeah, and it goes to, I mean, we were talking briefly about the servers. I think the servers there are exceptional. Obviously, they are from Canada, and like you said, they're very, very proud, too. Right. My my server was from British Columbia, and she talked to me about school there and life there and what it was like living where on the water where she was, etc. It was really great, and she was, and she was very attentive to us. She uh, visited us several times and got involved with our conversations as well. It was great. Absolutely. I've had the same experience there as well. All of my servers have been exceptional. And uh, I love the fact that all the countries there, all the servers and all the, the people that work there are native to that, that uh, pavilion's country. But right. well, let, let's get into the good stuff. People, you know, they could care less about the wine and the flat count. Right. They want to hear about the menu. And you can't talk about Le Cellier without mentioning the Canadian cheddar cheese soup. I mean, you can have that and the breadsticks and be done. That's your meal right there. Absolutely. The Canadian cheddar cheese soup, uh, smoked bacon, 
It's got beer in the soup itself and thick cheddar cheese. It's wonderful. Absolutely. It's it's like 4 or $5 for a cup of it, and it's rich, and it's creamy, and it's delicious. And, you know, like I said, you could order a couple of those <laughs> and just have the mirror. You know, they have the, uh, like I said, the pretzel bread and stuff like that. Get a drink, and you're done right there. Right. The three breads that come out, and but the pretzel bread with the uh, cheese soup is a uh, delicacy, and, and I would have been fine eating just that. <laughs> so... Absolutely. And when you go to Food and Wine Festival, you know, all the different pavilions have samples. The line for Canada's is so long because all people care about getting, beyond the beer, is the, <laughs> the cheddar cheese soup. Yes, but it's worth that wait because you probably won't be able to get into the restaurant to eat it. So get in the, get in the shorter line because uh, at least you, know, you don't need ADR at the wine, Food and Wine Festival. <laughs> Absolutely. So, And obviously, by virtue of its name being the, the steakhouse, Steak really is the focus of the menu, but there's a lot of different things on there, many of which are imported directly from Canada. Uh, right. The, the price ranges for lunch and dinner are about 15 to $30 probably per person. There's a lot of different wines from um, California and Oregon and Italy. But let's talk about some of the, or maybe our favorite things or some of the notable items on the menu. In addition to, um, at, the be- at the beginning, in addition to the Canadian cheddar cheese soup, the other thing that I really enjoyed was the shrimp cocktail, uh, which actually has a wasabi sl- coleslaw in it and horseradish, horseradish chili sauce. The was- wasabi slaw doesn't sound very Canadian to me, but it really was delicious. <laughs> it was all uh, mixed in nicely in a, a nice presentation, and uh, we really enjoyed that. That was another great thing we had as an appetizer. One of the things I like uh, on the appetizer menu as well, beyond the soup, is the seared rare tuna. Um, it's with a watercress uh-huh. salad. It's absolutely, I mean, very. I'm really, I love tuna. I love sushi. And mm-hmm. this is exceptional because you can tell how fresh it is. Um, there's also yes. a beefsteak tomato sack. Beefsteak tomato stack. Uh, <laughs> there's duck served two ways. There's duck confit and a smoked duck breast, which is excellent. Uh, right. Prince Edward and Island mussels. So, yeah, our, our server uh, was pushing the duck as her favorite thing. She said she she eats that whenever she eats there, uh, and she but she eats it quite often. I can imagine. I can imagine. But let's talk about some of the some of our favorite things on the entree list. Are there a couple of things that jump out at you when you go, or things you like to get? Oh, of course. Well, the 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 uh, filet mignon is probably their big. Uh, their biggest thing that they sell there, the La Cellier's mushroom filet mignon. It's a uh, that's delicious. Um, last visit, I had the New York strip steak, which was very good. It was uh, it wasn't the best cut of that day, but I think when you ever, ever anytime you're eating at a steakhouse, no matter where you are in the world, you uh, you take a chance of it having a little bit of uh, grizzle on or something like that. So it wasn't the best cut, but it still was deliciously prepared. Uh, I loved that. That was the New York strip steak. Right. I had the filet mignon last time I went. It was five ounces. It was served over cream cheese, mashed potatoes. God, my mouth is water as we're talking about this. (laughs) But for people who maybe are not big steak eaters, and there are a lot of other things. There are salads. There is a prime rib sandwich, chicken breast. Um, There is also a seared salmon salad, which is delicious. I've heard that before. They have a a squash ravioli, which is uh, supposed to be very interesting. Someone at my table had that. It's uh, squash ravioli. Uh, I didn't try that, but it really looked very good. And actually, some of the people at my table also got a a hamburger. And they thought it was the best tasting hamburger they've ever had in their lives. So that was... uh, you know, something I'm actually was thinking. You know, I should have gotten the burger this time. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we should be we should be clear because it's not like a Pecos Bills hamburger. This is really oh, no. it's a steak burger. I mean, it's it's a steak. Yes, it absolutely. is a steak. <laughs> absolutely. So even if you do, you know, but the it's a good option if you have kids that maybe just want to do that, or, or that's just what you feel like having. But right. Some of the things we were talking about, I it, you know, it's important. Remember, you're inside the theme park. You are inside a theme park, and and. I'm so trying to dispel that myth of Walt Disney World theme park must be hamburgers and chicken fingers and hot dogs. Clearly, um, this is one of those examples where there's so yes. much more to offer. Yes, I, I think about that all the time, and I actually have to cat. I have to stop myself at times because I have to remind myself that the restaurant I'm eating in is actually inside of a uh, a high traffic theme park, and uh, you know sometimes I actually become too critical. 
because I start forgetting where I am, and, and then I remember I'm eating inside of a, a theme park or a Disney park, and the food quality is so amazing. Absolutely. I agree. But, let you know, we could really just have cheddar cheese soup, pretzel bread, and then go right to dessert. Because right the, to dessert. Dessert, <laughs> the desserts here are exceptional, and I think probably some of the best in World Showcase. There are campfire s'mores, again, for the kid or the kid mm-hmm. at heart. There's a cherry <laughs> shortcake, chocolate mousse, chocolate whiskey chocolate sage. whiskey cake. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I had a feeling you were going to stop me there. The chocolate whiskey chocolate cake. Chocolate whiskey yeah. cake, yes. Probably their signature That's- dessert. Their signature dessert and well worthy of the signature, and uh, yeah, you can go right from the uh, the cheddar cheese soup to the the whiskey cake, and that, that's not to shoot down the entree at all. The entree was wonderful, but uh, sometimes you just think that the uh, dessert is the best part. <laughs> <laughs> so between the cheddar cheese soup and the bread and the whiskey cake with a creme brulee sampler, you better uh, do a couple of laps around the promenade to walk. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, it's. But there are and also. Oh, go ahead. Go right ahead. I would say, in addition to the appetizers, the entrees, and desserts, there's also uh, a very extensive drink menu. And again, you are in a cellar, you are in a wine cellar, and there's a very large selection of dessert wines and red wines, sparkling wines from all different right. areas. And some of them are on the higher end, some of them are, are a little bit more on the rare side. So if you are a wine connoisseur, you'll find some great selections here as well. Yes, and they also brought in uh, many traditional uh, Canadian beers as well. So if you're a beer drinker, that's also available to you. Uh, and the they they have the the, the blue glow teeny, mm-hmm. uh, which is another one of their fancy drinks that they have there. So you know the, you, you're you're not limited in your choices. Yeah, a couple of times ago when I was there, somebody ordered something called a Toronto Politan. I guess they're taking right. on a on a Cosmopolitan, which was iceberg vodka, Chambord, cranberry, and orange juice. And a cherry. And uh, the, the meals that I've had in the last few times have just been exceptional. And you can see why La Cellier Steakhouse has the reputation that it has. Yes. Now, well, any anytime I'm going to, I know I'm going to Disney Park, I call and check availability on every single day that I'm there. And it's quite often I can't get in. But on those times that it does become available, I kind of work my schedule around it. Right. And the other thing, too, is if you really want to dine here, and I think you should if you can, try and be a little bit more flexible with the times that you eat. Either have a very late lunch or a very early dinner. Um, and I actually suggest the early dinner so you can really take advantage of some of the great things that they have on the menu. Um, or right. even try and go late. You know, If you can have a late dinner, maybe if you don't have kids or, or if they can get a snack beforehand, try and eat late. And you'll have a much easier time um, trying to get in. And if you do go there, if you do get an ADR or if you are going to try and wait to get in one nice thing that you can do especially at night is walk around the pavilions and view the victoria gardens which are just absolutely exceptional yes absolutely yeah and it's actually the whole the whole environment's very romantic and if uh if you are in the mood for some romance that that, that's a a, it serves the bill very well definitely and i feel that way about world showcase at night i I absolutely love wandering world showcase at night especially um if you go up um, until they throw you out. Until you throw it right. Until you get kicked out of the park. It's <laughs> wonderful. But how do you think, Len, Le Cellier Steakhouse ranks among some of the other restaurants in World Showcase? I think in World Showcase, it is it is probably the, it is the top. It is the it is the pinnacle in World Showcase. It's my absolute favorite in World Showcase. Uh, it doesn't have the entertainment uh, of. Say like Germany, or uh, it doesn't have the environment. You can say, say you like the belly dancer in Morocco. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's still family friendly. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. And then, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it is my favorite as far as as the food quality. It doesn't have the environment of say Mexico, uh, but it is a very fulfilling meal, and you really feel like you've eaten a great dinner. Absolutely, and I think it even ranks up there with some of the other dining experiences around property as a whole. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, Walt Disney World, and we're going to cover these on future shows, has some exceptional restaurants and exceptional steakhouses like the Yachtsman Steakhouse and like Shula's. And I think Le Cellier, remembering, too, that it is inside the park, can rank up there. Uh, And and I've had some delicious meals there, and I I think it's exceptional. Yes. But if you you go in and you are a bit, uh, and you're a little tepid of eating strange things, it's a very safe menu. Absolutely. 
good point. That's a really good point. Is it, there's there's a, oh, there's plenty of things on there that that are that shouldn't scare you off. I mean, you don't have to get the duck confit if uh, that's not right. <laughs> if that's not part of your normal eating habits. But again, who doesn't love cheese soup? I mean, there's just no... <laughs> <laughs> you had to bring that up again. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the other thing we should mention, too, is it, it is on the Disney Dining Plan. It is a Disney Dining Plan restaurant. And if you're an annual pass holder, they do take the Disney Dining Experience card. So you can get 20% uh, discount, except during some of the holiday seasons. So don't let some of the prices scare you either. Uh, because, right. Because some of the entrees are, you know, $20 and up. You can still get, you know, discounts if, if you have either of those things so right. um i think all in all you we can't recommend la Cellier enough if you haven't tried it definitely try and get in be a little bit more flexible with your times uh, and try and book your adrs as soon as possible absolutely so glenn whalen thank you again for uh helping to wet mine and hopefully our listeners appetites we did yak and Eddie first we did la Cellier second um definitely research trip in our near future yes <laughs> yeah because right now i'm going to head over and get some campbell's cheese soup and see what's what's going to happen with that but i'm sure it's not going to go over so well not quite the same buddy thanks very much for coming on i really appreciate it lou anytime my friend thank you see you in canada <laughs> After back-to-back impressive showings during our last Fact or Fiction segments, young Cody Pepper's reputation precedes him. Yet we're still all unsure as to whether the apple clearly does not fall far from the tree, that is Jeff Pepper, or whether Cody's been feeding his father's information for years. So I thought we'd have Cody come on back to give it another shot. I want to welcome the 14-year-old boy genius and future Lou Mangello sidekick, Cody Pepper, son of Jeff Pepper, to the show. Cody, welcome back, buddy. Hi, Lou. All right, you you ready for uh, you ready for another fact or fiction segment? Oh yeah, definitely. All right, let's give a little quick history here. Before I even knew Jeff, I had done a segment on another podcast. We did Who Wants to Be a Mouseketeer, where I was asking trivia questions to people who called up. You called in and were the only person that got all the questions right, and you were 13 at the time. And then, as fate would have it, I met your dad, and we started doing the segments together. And then I had you come on, um, I think maybe June or July, and again, you knocked it out of the park. I think you got them all right. So um, I, I got emails basically from about every listener under the age of 14. Where I got maybe about 40 or so emails from people saying, hey, I could do it too. I'm only nine. I'm only 11. So what I thought was, uh, and I have you come on one more time again, no prizes. We're not keeping score. We're just going to do some true or false questions. We call it fact or fiction, just a kind of fun way to share some trivia and, and just have some fun. So um, we thought, you know, we thought it would be a little fun to do this again. So get ready. Take another bite of your Mickey bar um, because it's go time, buddy. (laughs) All right. So here's your first question. Miyuki is the only female Japanese candy artist in the world. Fact or fiction? Fact. That's right. She is the only female candy artist. She is the uh, she can be found over in the Japan Pavilion. We talked about her uh, when we covered this in our DSI segment. She's only one of 20 people in the entire world and the only female anywhere to perform this very rare Japanese art where they take um, these little this little bit of rice dough and with just some scissors and some tweezers makes beautiful animals and flowers and things like that. And it's free. Uh, again, she was she did her apprenticeship in Japan and still to this day is the only female uh, candy artist in the world. So, all right, let's go to number two. Fact or fiction, Cody, the hydrolators in Epcot's The Living Seas used to descend only two feet. Uh, fiction. No, I, I want to say fiction. I want to say they didn't descend at all, but I guess I'll go f- Mm, fact, I guess. Well, I'm going to take your first mm. answer of fiction because you, you were on the right track. They, they didn't really descend. They only moved about two inches, um, although some people seem to perceive that 
they, they did move more, but they only went down two inches, and the bubbles on the side gave you the impression that you were, you know, descending uh, 20,000 leagues under the... Let me ask you another question. You know that dinosaurs, you know, in the attractions aren't real, correct? You know they, yeah. they You know that they can't hurt huh. you? You know, they're fake, they're bolted to the floor. Oh, I see and... where this is going. <laughs> and how old are you again, just to be clear? 14. Okay. Anyway, let's move on to question number three. <laughs> <laughs> Cosmic <laughs> Rays was originally known as the Tomorrowland Terrace. Fact or fiction? Uh, fiction. That's actually no. true. Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> I was going to go to change I lost it, that so. one. I lost that one. That's right. It's actually true. Uh, it was originally known, Cosmic Rays Starlight Cafe was originally known as the Tomorrowland Terrace Restaurant. That was a counter service uh, way before your time, actually, but they served very funky things called... Um, the Orbit Burger, which was a hamburger, a Moon Burger, which was a cheeseburger, and Gemini Burger, which was two beef patties, as well as the Space Dog. And the one interesting thing about the restaurant was they had different colored ketchup and mustard and mayonnaise to kind of give you that sort of futuristic outer space feel, I guess, as though the color of ketchup and mustard would change in the future. But it closed, <laughs> it reopened as Cosmic Rays in December of 1994. So uh, you get a pass on that one because it was, it was pre-Cody days. Um, all right, here's your next one. <laughs> Easter Sunday is the busiest day of the year at Walt Disney World. Fiction. And what do you think it is? Christmas. Uh, excellent. Christmas Day is the busiest day of the year at Walt Disney World. Very good. All right, let's see how much you pay attention to the show. World of Motion was originally sponsored by General Electric. World of Motion in could Epcot. Could you repeat the question? Oh, uh, could you repeat the question? World of Motion in Epcot was originally sponsored by General Electric. World of Motion sat uh, where Test Track sits today. Fiction. And why is it fiction? Because I believe it was General Motors. Excellent. Excellent. All right, so you got the tricky one. Good. Let's stay in Epcot and go to World Showcase. La Salle the oh-so-popular restaurant in Canada, was originally a buffet. Fact or fiction? Fiction? No, it, it's actually true. Um, way back Ugh. when, when it first opened, it was or- originally a buffeteria, and uh, back in 1997, it changed to a sit-down restaurant. It was actually used to just be called Le Cellier. Now, technically, the name is Le Cellier Steakhouse. And when it was a buffet, they actually had some cool stuff there. They had things like maple syrup pie and a lot of salmon dishes, uh, a little bit more of a, a Canadian flair to the menu at the time. So, um, all right, we're, we're going to stay in Walk Showcase, give you a chance to redeem yourself. Fact or fiction, <laughs> you won't find any images or patterns containing uh, people or animals or plants in the Morocco Pavilion. No images of plants or animals or people, anything like that in Morocco. That were drawn. At all, anywhere. In tiles or artwork, anything like that. Oh, wait, wait, let me ask you this. Is this... Are you saying physically in the architecture or just in the entire pavilion? In the entire pavilion, as far as, you know, decorative elements and, and architecture, all that kind of stuff. Oh, that's fiction. It's actually true, and here's the reason why. The belief is that only Allah can create life to the Moroccan people. So it would have been, um, they, they didn't want their artists to come over and try and create some sort of living creature or living being. And that's why everything there in there. Well, not did only, you say, you say uh, there aren't any people or anything? There are there any pictures of people or anything in the pavilion? Right. Any, any sort of drawn pictures of people, things like that. You're going to get a pass on that I one. I would have maybe. to, well, wait, wait, actually, I would have to say. <laughs> That is not true. If you go back towards the back of the pavilion, uh, there is a weird shrine to Aladdin where they have pictures of him all over it. All right, so let's are... move on to question number eight. and <laughs> 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 We're going to bounce back over to the Magic Kingdom and see, um, see how well you know your, your Disney World history. Fact or fiction, was there ever a, an antique shop, a real antique shop in the Magic Kingdom? Fact or fiction? Uh, there was fact. That's right. It was the Old World Antiques that was in Liberty Square, Square, and they had real antiques from old jewelry to uh, furniture, as well as some reproductive reproductions. 
of some things, and some of the prices of things were, were really up in the, the thousands and thousands of dollars, but the quality of it was, was exceptional, and, um, and that, show, that shop obviously is long since gone. So um, let's move on to question number nine. You're actually doing very well. And let's see if you listened to your copy of the audio guide to Walt Disney World yet, available at DisneyWorldTrivia.com. And when Walt Disney World opened, the Walt Disney World Railroad only had one train station, fact or fiction. So when the park first fact. opened, that's right. It was only, and where was it? Um, would that be the main street? That's right. No. No, yes. you're right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, for about eight months, there was the only station on the, on the line was at Main Street. So it really was just a sort of a round trip that you could take on this. And it was a D-ticket attraction. And in 1972, they built the Frontierland Railroad Station near Pecos Bill Cafe. Obviously, that's not there anymore because when they built Splash Mountain, they tore that down in 1990. And in December of 91, they opened a new Frontierland train station, which is actually part of the Sp- Splash Mountain uh, building over there. So... And uh, obviously, in 1988, they built the third train station, which was over in Mickey's Birthday Land. So, all right. Last question, again, about an extinct attraction for you. Skippy was the name of the pilot in Cranium Command. Uh, that's false. He was the, uh, the little alien from uh, Alien Encounter pre-show. Very good. Very good. And do you remember the name of the little boy that was the pilot in, um, in Cranium Command? Oh, uh... Oh, I'm trying to remember now. Um, I know it. This is uh, Buzzy. Give me a, it was uh, Buzzy. Okay, there you go. Yep, it was Buzzy. <laughs> he was the kind of guy that piloted the brain as the as the kid went to school and kind of dealt with all those different things. So, but Cody, again, you did excellent. So Jeff, better watch out because there is a new pepper in town, and his name is Cody. So I, I hope you had fun. I like doing these things with you, and again, uh, always impressive at, at your font of Disney knowledge. Thanks, Lou. So, hey, is your dad? Are you coming down to Mouse Fest? Is your dad taking you to Mouse Fest? No, not even uh, to, not even to carry his bags. My, my and, horrible dad is abandoning me here at home. Not even to you know fend off all the paparazzi and, and fans that are going to be flocking around him. None of that. <laughs> no. Nope. I'll have to have a talking to with your father. Don't worry about <laughs> that. So, all right, buddy. Thanks again. Thanks. Baseball may be America's pastime, but inside the gates of Walt Disney World, kids and kids at heart love nothing more than searching out and hopefully finding hidden Mickeys. So back once again is the man who literally wrote the books on the subject, the hardest working man in show business, Dr. Stephen Barrett. Steve, welcome back, buddy. Thanks for having me back, Lou. It's good to be back. It seems like it's been a while, so uh, I'm looking forward to to uh, meeting with you on, on your podcast uh, routinely. It's great to be back. It's great to have you back, and I really appreciate you coming on and talking about some of the new Hidden Mickeys and, and asking listeners to help you kind of decide about some of the questionable ones. But, you know, we talked about seeing each other, and we, we actually had a chance to get together last month um, during Mouse Fest, which, which was just such a great time for me. Um, tell us a little bit about how your Mouse Fest experience was, because this is really where your adoring fans get the chance to kind of get up close and personal with you and get their handshakes and where you lead your, your droves of people around the parks and, and really what's some of the most popular meets of Mouse Fest. That's correct, Lou. And as I, as I said before, Mouse Fest is, is the high point of my year, my entire year. I mean, it's the most fun I have all year. Um, the, the, the main issue with the Hidden Mickey hunts, uh, first of all, is uh, that Mouse Fest is centered in the, in the theme parks. So that's where the Hidden Mickey hunts are held. And unfortunately, I haven't figured out a way to do tours off uh, out of the theme parks. But there's some wonderful Hidden Mickeys in the resorts and, and elsewhere around Disney World. So... But that being said, there's many more years of material for Mouse Fest Hidden Mickey Hunts in the theme parks. The other the other thing that came out of this year, Lou, was that um, 
some of the meats, as you know, as as your meat, uh, as you experience, some of the meats are becoming a little unwieldy with the numbers of folks that 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 uh, c- come around and want to do the uh, tours. And I, I, so far, I've tried to accommodate everybody, but with, with such large groups, it, it's not necessarily uh, a good experience for the people that are in the back and they can't hear me. Well, you've got your so, fans, you've got the paparazzi, you've got your handlers, so it, I can see how it's <laughs> tough for you. <laughs> well, I, I was thinking next year maybe to publish a, uh, a, a, a sort of a round number that I think would, would be a workable tour size. If people want to join in, that, that's fine, too. In fact, that's one of the funnier experiences. Uh, when, it, when we were doing the Epcot World Showcase Hidden Mickey's Tour uh, hunt, Somebody, or actually, there were two or three people that just joined in. They were just passers by, and they figured out that we were looking for hidden Mickey's and just sort of joined in with their glasses of wine and <laughs> and uh, strutted with us around World Showcase. But it was fun. I mean, it, I don't think it uh, irritated anybody. They they participated. They voted on the marginal ones, just like uh, the rest of the group. So, uh, so yeah, I, I expect that uh, I won't have any problems with people uh, joining in. But just understanding that. Uh, if the groups get too large, it, it dilutes the experience a bit. Well, I'll tell you something. I'm sure that if you did Hidden Mickey's at the resorts, you know, if you build it, they will come. So if you do it, I'm sure people would come. And uh, it might be a nice experience. When a little bit more intimate, you would maybe wouldn't have so many people and uh, a little bit something different. So That's a good idea. I might, I might try that. I might Sign try me that up. Because... I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> there, there's some uh, really wonderful Hidden Mickey's in the resorts, and... And uh, new ones that come along all the time. So that may, maybe we'll do that in the future. Well, you know, there was something I wanted to ask you because it was something that I noticed uh, during Mouse Fest, and I wanted to get your opinion on it. And I, I, I guess it could call, qualify as a type of hidden Mickey. And I, I've looked on your site to try and see if you had any on there. And I, I would call it like a positional Mickey, you know, based on how you stand and if you look just the kind of the right way, things kind of line up to be hidden Mickeys. And some. You know, you can't tell if they were put there purposely or if it's just one of those accidental, incidental ones. How do you kind of feel about ones that you, where you really need to stand just a certain way to kind of catch the Mickey head and ears just right? My initial reaction to those is, is negative. So there, there have to be other criteria that, that sell me on it. Um, one, one that comes to mind is, is uh, 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 the one at, at Club Cool in Epcot. In the, in the rear doors, when, when the doors are open, the circles line up uh, in one spot to form a uh, classic Mickey. And they're on different doors, but they line up, and it's clearly positional. But I kind of like that one, and uh, I could even convince myself that it might be purposeful. You know, there, there's another one that I, I've been debating for years, and uh, people email me periodically about it, and it's, it's the one... At uh, is it uh, Bill and Men's Dockside Diner in the, in the Hollywood Studios? Right. I think I got that name right. But anyway, it's um, when you stand uh, in front of the great movie ride or the hat and look towards the diner. There, the the uh, the sign is oval, and then some portholes in the boat behind the sign make the ears. And if you stand just right, it kind of makes a classic Mickey image but that that's clearly a positional one and I am not convinced at all that that was purposeful so uh, I haven't really I haven't really uh, cottoned onto that one so yeah you know the positional Mickeys are there and they have to have other attributes for me to to really accept them and put them on my website that's a good question because there are a number of them around one of them I recently accepted because uh, a number of people voted it in is uh, on Main Street in the Magic Kingdom, <clears throat> and, and on the train station roof or ceiling, not uh, train station ceiling. When you uh, stand in t- uh, Town Square with your back to the castle, and you're looking at the train station, if if you close in to the uh, to the entrance of the train station about maybe 20 feet away the circles on the ceiling uh, line up to form a classic mickey and that's, a, that's a pretty cool one and I, I i actually asked people to vote on that one and most people liked it so i put it on the website 
Hmm. But that's a positional one that seems to, uh, you know, be acceptable to most people. You know, you're now opening the door to people sending you. If you think you're getting <laughs> pictures before, you're really going to get a ton of them now. So. <laughs> oh, I know. Well, I, I, I get. I review every photo that I try to that people send me, and sometimes I do get overloaded and, and behind. But <clears throat> you know, I, I, I'm, I'll be honest. Uh, a lot of the photos people send me are, are wishful thinking, marginal um, sightings, I believe, and um, so I, I probably. As far as the number of photos people send me, maybe maybe 20 or 30 percent eventually end up on the website or in the book. 30 percent, I would say, uh, because a lot of them are are, are just marginal and, and wishful thinking. Other uh, many of those I'll put on in, in the questionable section of my website so people can vote. But I understand people want want to you know they're looking everywhere for for hidden Mickey's, and I love doing it myself. And some of the images look appealing and. Uh, maybe just don't fit the criteria that I like to, to call it a classic Mickey. I told you, it's a big deal when Steve Barrett says that you found a new hidden Mickey. I, I've been there and I know the feeling. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. I still remember yours uh, at the uh, Beaches and Cream. You know, the onion rings there at, uh, at the boardwalk, the Be- Beaches and Cream shop. We were there once and you pointed it out. and the First time I'd seen it. My claim to fame, right there. So. It's a great, it's a great classic Mickey, there, Lou, and you spotted it. <laughs> All right. So, are there any um, any new hidden Mickeys for 2008? Well, actually, there's a couple I want to talk about that are new, and 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 then I want to mention uh, a couple of ones that have been around a while that I finally spotted. Uh, Spaceship Earth, as you know, um, has had some soft openings, and I uh, was able to get on the ride a couple of times and my sister uh, also was here recently and took took some photos of hidden mickeys for me thankfully the paint circle uh classic mickey is still there i mean thank goodness that's a wonderful uh, classic mickey uh, off to the left when you're on spaceship earth it's uh it's uh in the first part of the renaissance scene with the painter right okay so that's still there there's another. There's a really good one, because uh, and it's hard to spot. It's hard to find. But uh, my sister took a good photo of it, and I want to put it on my website, you know, soon. But anyway, it's uh, it's in the part of Spaceship Earth where um, the they're they're introducing the uh, scholars, uh, the Islamic scholars, and the um, and the, the, the wise men that uh, developed the alphabet and did right. writings and that sort of thing. And off to the left of the of your vehicle is a, a scholar in, in a blue robe who's reading a book, and behind him are some shelves. And on the second shelf, and it's uh, and it's also the second shelf from the right. Is uh, are three scrolls, and it's a beautiful little classic Mickey. There, it, it looks purposeful to me, and it's proportionate, and uh, it, it's a uh, it's a great classic Mickey made of scrolls. And then another sighting on on Spaceship Earth, and I'm sort of toying with putting it up is uh, in the first part of the boys' room. Uh, is a is a Pinocchio album. It's on the left part of the room, and it's standing up upright. In, in a, there's a bunch of albums that are, uh, you know, the record old record albums mm-hmm. that are standing on end. And the, the the last one that you can see that's facing you is a Pinocchio uh, soundtrack album. So and oh, okay. it clearly says Pinocchio on it. That's that's a pretty cool image. Are these are these up on your website yet? No, no. I need to put them up. Uh, I, I've been studying them. I just got the photo of the three scrolls. You know, just recently, and and uh, but I'll put them up on my website. I I also like to make sure I have before I put something up. I like to make sure I have a good description of where to find it. You know, um, and so I'll I'll often go back and make notes and that sort of thing, so I can tell people exactly where it is. So th- those are uh, those are cool images of Spaceship Earth. I think some of them may be lost. 
in, in uh, Spaceship Earth because they remodeled a, a number of the rooms. But uh, I think those images are new and they'll be fun to find. Now, the one that I'm excited about that I just spotted recently, and I, I've been looking for this one for years. It's in the, uh, it's in the great movie right in the Indiana Jones room. I've heard for a long time about a uh, C-3PO and R2-D2 image on the, in the hieroglyphics on the left wall. And I finally, knew, I finally uh, figured out where to look, and it's directly across from the Ark. Men are lifting. It's between the two uh, big, tall statues. Now, and by the way, just past the second statue is the Mickey and Donald uh, hieroglyphic. It's on my website. Before you get to that second statue, it's directly in the middle between the two statues is, is R2-D2 and C-3PO on, uh, in the hieroglyphics there. And there's a, an Egyptian kneeling before R2-D2. And it's in a dark area, so it's, it's kind of hard to spot. You have to look exactly in the center between the two statues. And it's um, a little bit above eye level from the or maybe right at our level for, uh, in the vehicle. So that's a great one to spot. I, and I, I finally uh, spotted that. I'm going to put that up on my website here, here soon. And, and the other one in that room that people have told me about for years that I never was able to find is a, uh, a great little classic Mickey. It's a white classic Mickey on a tablet, and it's standing upright. And it's it's um, it's above a and to the left of a snake's head. It's off to the right of the vehicle, and it's uh, just beyond one of the flames that's uh, burning there. It's against the wall, uh, the back wall, and uh, it's between two men in white, white men that are standing facing each other. So it's between the two men standing there it's on a tablet standing up against the wall and it's just to the left of a of an orange snake's head and it's a white classic mickey beautiful i finally got a photo of it in fact the only way my sister was able to get this photo was because the ride stalled there <laughs> you know <laughs> that often happens with hidden mickeys if the ride stalls get out your camera and look around because you may find some new ones so i finally because your vehicle moves through the indiana jones room and you just you just have to know where to look for these things and whip your head around and uh, not as not as not as bad as test track test track you really got to know where to look when you're, <laughs> when you're uh, on the test track vehicle but but anyway uh, the ride stalled and we finally got a good photo that I'll put on my website of this uh, beautiful classic white classic Mickey on a tablet. You know, when you were talking about uh, C three PO and R two D two, it got me thinking again about some of the other non mickey quote unquote hidden mickeys around the parks and i remember a couple of years ago you and i were talking about one that you were so happy to find and probably one of the largest of the non-character hidden mickeys and that's the hidden jafar can you tell us a little bit where the where the jafar is and how people can find it because that, that's a tough one um to spot i tried finding it for somebody and i couldn't actually point it out to them Yes. Um, it, well, it's such a huge image that y you have to sort of take it all in as you're standing on the bridge looking at it. But it's, um, it's in the animal kingdom, and it's, um, it's on the uh, Pangani Forest. Uh, is that right, where the gorillas are? Right, yeah. yep. Pangani Forest Exploration Trail. It's just past the gorilla viewing area, and there's sort of a, uh, a suspension bridge that you walk across. And if you go about halfway along the bridge, or a little, maybe two-thirds of the way, and turn to your right and look to look back at this huge rock standing, towering over you, you'll see the outline of Jafar's face on, on the edge of the rock. It the, it's molded, and the, and the rock is uh, sculpted. The front of the rock is sculpted uh, as Jafar's face. Now, sometimes it'll have some uh, vines on it and, and, and plants growing on it, and it may hide some features of Jafar's face, but um, I think that that one's going to be there for forever. Hopefully, I mean that's that's just a gorgeous, a, a gorgeous hidden character. Yeah, I, mean, I, I was ecstatic to finally find that one. 
because even the, some of the cast members at the Animal Kingdom uh, couldn't tell me where it was. And, I, and one January day a few years ago, I, I stumbled across it. And it's a, it's a great Eureka experience when you spot that one for the first time. Okay. Wonderful hidden image. And that one's on your website as well? Yes. Okay. Oh, yes. And, yes, uh, it's in, on my website and in the, in the, in the uh, third edition of the Hidden Mickey's book. But, yeah, I would encourage you, if you're in Animal Kingdom, by all means, check that one out, because it is a beautiful hidden character image. All right, and, and lastly, are there any... Um, I know you always ask people to come by and check out and vote on some of the questionable hidden Mickeys, and I know you have a bunch of new ones up on the site since last time we talked. Are there any one of the ones that you just are just so on the fence about that you want people to really take a look at and see? Um. Well, I, you know, one comes to mind. Let me see if I, uh, I think I have it up for a vote. Maybe not, but I may put it up. It's, uh, people write me about this one, and I'm really on the fence about it. It's, uh, and, and in fact, I, I wanted to take my Hidden Mickey Hunt group in, uh, in uh, the studios to see it, but the group was so large, it, it wouldn't have worked. I mean, it, it would have uh, interfered with the guests. So, but anyway, it's at the uh, it's at the end of Tower of Terror, and it's uh, as you get off the uh, your elevator ride and, and you're exiting. There's uh, you know where the photo uh, image area is, where you look at your photos right on the screen, and then below that uh, photo image area is a is a window. There's a room that you can look into, and if you uh, if you look in the room and turn left, there's there's some gauges in a drawer, in a cabinet drawer, mm-hmm. that uh, kind of simulate a classic Mickey. One of the ears is turned funny, you know, and I, I, I've been debating about that one. So I, I may put that up for a vote, and uh, yeah, I, I would need some help with that one, because I'm, I'm very much on the fence about that one. And I wanted my Hidden Mickey Hunt group to vote on it, just to see what they, they think. But it's definitely marginal, it's not... You know, it doesn't meet a lot of the criteria that I like for a classic Mickey. As you know, most of this debate is about classic three-circle Mickeys, not not other more definite Mickey images. But that's part of the fun of it. And if people vote it in, I'll put it on the website. Yeah, there you go. I, I can be I can be convinced. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a, it's a democracy, not a dictatorship. So <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. All right, Steve, buddy. This is always a lot of fun. I always appreciate you coming back on the show again. To find out more, to go look at some of Steve's Hidden Mickeys, to vote on some of the questionable ones, and to submit your own if you have any, you can submit a photo. Uh, you can go to HiddenMickeysGuide.com. There you can also pick up um, either or both or all of Steve's book. He's got the Hidden Mickeys Guide to Walt Disney World, Disneyland, and lest we forget, the Hassle-Free Guide to Walt Disney World. There you go. Thanks, Lou. I appreciate the uh, the information there for everybody. Steve, Great. thank you, and I will uh, I will see you next month. Absolutely, Lou. Looking forward to it. All right. Take care. We have reached the finish line of this week's episode, and hopefully no one got swept along the way. I want to thank you for tuning in once again and hope you enjoyed the show. I also want to thank my guests, Glenn Whalen from the Passamaquoddy blog, Cody Pepper, mentor to Father Jeff Pepper, and Steve Barrett from Hidden Mickey's Guide for all their help this week. Next week, I will be back with news and rumors as well as your emails and voicemails. So if you want to be on the air, email me at lou at wdwradio.com or call the voicemail at 206 206- 202-4WDW. You can also discuss the show and anything Disney over at the forums at DisneyWorldTrivia.com. Please go by and visit our show notes page at WDWRadio.com for links as well as some recommended sites and friends of the show, including OwnersLocker.com. You can learn more there, find out about their free trial offer, and have your own personal secure storage locker delivered to and from your resort. For the best prices on official and authorized Disney tickets, go and visit OrlandoFunTickets.com and go check out AttractionsMagazine.com to subscribe to the new Orlando Attractions Magazine. Issue 2 is almost ready, but you can still get Issue 1 or subscribe over at AttractionsMagazine.com. 
Just want to remind you that the first in my audio guide to Walt Disney World series of CDs is out and available at DisneyWorldTrivia.com, along with both of my books. Look for the next in the CD series coming soon and an announcement of a new project I've been working on that will be available later on this year. As I get ready to launch the new DisneyWorldTrivia.com site, I'm still looking for some old photos from Walt Disney World from the 70s to the 90s. If you have anything you want to share, please go ahead and send those over to me at Lou at WDWRadio.com. Thank you again for tuning in this week. Please continue to help spread the word. So until next week, I'll see ya.